In the previous video, we went over how to set up an AI environment suitable for reinforcement learning applications for the dinosaur game. So if you haven't checked that out already, I highly recommend doing so if you're not already familiar with the AI gym setup. So in a reinforcement learning agent environment, a reinforcement learning task is to train an agent that interacts with its environment. A specific scenario is considered a state, and with each scenario, the agent predicts an action to perform. In the dinosaur game, the action will either do nothing or jump. And the main objective of the agent is to maximize its reward across an episode. The reward is the distance and an episode is everything between the initial state and the terminal state within the environment. We continuously reinforce the agent to learn to perform the best actions and this is known as a policy. Cue learning is where the agent will perform a sequence of actions which will presumably maximize the total reward. The Q value can be determined by the perceived reward at the current state and performing action, plus a gamma term multiplied by the highest Q value by the next state. The gamma term is adjustable and this determines the contribution of reward in the future. Now a deep Q network uses the logic of Q learning in conjunction with a three layered convolutional network. Let's go over the high level steps for our DQN demonstration. First, you'd want to feed a game screen, which is considered to be the state to the deep Q network, which will return Q values for all possible actions in the current state. You will select an action using the epsilon greedy policy and then initially the action will be random but based on the random action you will choose the action that has a maximum q value you'll then perform the action and move to the next state to obtain the reward you're going to store this transition to a memory buffer as well you'll then sample random batches of transitions from the memory buffer to calculate the loss okay so i'm going to be going through on how to implement a dqn in relation to the reinforcement learning uh, process related to the AI dinosaur game. Uh, note that these links that I attached with this particular script provided a lot of inspiration and a lot of details that I actually used throughout this entire script over here. Uh, so do make sure to check them out. Uh, these links will still be attached to the script when I push all of my changes to my GitHub repository, which is attached down into the description. Now let's go over the main function really quickly. So the only thing I'm really doing here is that I'm just initializing my T-Rex environment in this case, and then I'm calling the run function. Uh, note that all these other variables that I'm, you know, just commented out are related to just recording each one of the given, I guess like law scores, actions, or Q values, but I did not really, I didn't actually implement it, but due to the complexity, but you could do so by just, you know, passing in the data frames a part of the function and just incorporate each of the rows, just append the rows to its associated data frame and you can have somewhat of a logging structure related to your data frames. Uh, before we go to the run function, let's go ahead and go over the initialization part. Uh, so this is just the uh, batch size related to however many images that we want to extract from the um, overall memory array that we have going on. Um, and this is just, we're just going to be calling out 32 random images and then we're going to be training uh, the predictive network um, and you know update its weights. We have 10,000 games over here uh, where each game is, this is also in sequential order. So it's like with each game being the dinosaur starting and then it ending on some obstacle because it failed the game. Uh, we initialize our environment, we have our action size, and then we initialize our agent where our agent is essentially our DQN model. Our action size is two, uh, it's gonna be initialized uh, well, you, you could be calling a zero or a one, depending on what action it's going to be, where a zero is doing nothing, and a one is where the dinosaur is actually jumping over the obstacles. So let's go over the agent really quick. Um, this is the agent class. Uh, so we have some additional initialized parameters here. We have a storage of where our model exists. We have two for our action size. And this is our memory array, where I mentioned earlier, our batch size will be referencing 32 random images from this memory, and it'll retrain the prediction network. Uh, we have our epsilon, epsilon min, and gamma, uh, which is primarily used to update the Q values. Uh, we also have our decay over here. Uh, so the epsilons are pretty much just used to update or decide whether or not we should be using a random value right here uh, to you know predict what the dinosaur should be doing or should it rather go ahead and you know utilize the actual model itself and predict uh, based on what state is currently at. 
uh, but we use that epsilon value to determine if it should just use random actions or so. Okay, so after that, uh, we have our dimensions of our given image. In this case, 300, 300 by one, where one is the number of channels. Uh, and then this is just the rows and this is the height. So it really depends on uh, how large your dimensions of your specific image you would want it to be. Uh, but in this case, I just made it so that's 300, 300 by one. Uh, we have, of course, our update rate, and this is for every 1,000 iterations, we want to update the weights of our predictive network to our target network. So our predictive network is the one that's continuously being trained, right? And it's like slowly diverging from the original model, which is just uh, right here, our model portion right here. Uh, as you know, it's going to be our target model, I should say. Our target model is our original model, and our predictive model is just our model in this case. So uh, the primary reason behind this is that it's just the DQN process of where it has like two neural network models. It's training one, and then it's updating the old one um, after, you know, after in this case, 1,000 iterations for the update rate here. Uh, and the primary reason behind this is to sort of more keep the models in check and you're going to have two different Q values based on the uh, predictive model and the target model itself and then the loss function will be, you know, subtraction of those two and then square those values. That is going to be the loss. Uh, nonetheless, uh, after that, after you initialize the values and update its weight, I just print out the summary over here. So what the model looks like over here is that we're just, I'm using a Keras, by the way, Keras backend. Uh, but it's going to be three convolutional layers and connected with a fully connected layer of 512 and then go ahead and um, uh, create the number of outputs with whichever number of actions you're going to be using in this case i have two so it's going to be ending with two output uh, output nodes i should say uh, based on doing nothing or jumping um, and then just activating with linear uh, and then of course use the atom optimizer and then you have your model and then the other functions are just, you know, update the target model based on the weights, uh, based on the mo uh, predictive model weights, I should say. You have a safe model function. And then this is our act function, which is, as I mentioned earlier, this determines whether or not the dinosaur is going to be, you know, jumping or doing nothing based on a zero or a one value. And that's what these logics are doing over here, where it's using the epsilon to determine whether or not it's going to be using a random state or a predictive state. Uh, either or is going to have one of those values. And then we have a remember function. Uh, and then this is just appending images and its associated action, reward, next date, and done. We'll go a little bit deeper into this, uh, but this is what uh, the deck of 5,000 images are going to be appended by using this function over here. And then our replay, uh, this is just going to be going through our given uh, memory um, based on this memory over here. It's just going to be iterating through the memory. Uh, and it's going to be in batch sizes of 32 images based on the state, action, reward, and next state done, etc. cetera. Uh, and then it will decide, you know, whether or not it's going to be updated in target Q value or just be using the regular Q value if it's not done or done. And then, you know, just go through the process over here of where it's going to be iteratively training its model uh, based on the predictive network model. Okay, and then once the model has been fit and everything, like once it's done iterating through the mini batch, uh, we will then update the epsilon value if it's greater than our epsilon minimum, which in this case, the epsilon minimum was a value of 0 0.1 over here. So if it's greater than that, it will go ahead and decay the epsilon by multiplying by the epsilon decay, which is 99.5% as noted there. Okay, so let's go to the run function. Um, that is essentially underneath the dyno initialization port and it's over here. And so very high level, I have a try finally uh, statement going on. So if I want to manually get out of this particular program, um, it will save the model inside of the model's dyno runner.h5 file. And I will automatically have the most up-to-date model uh, if I want to exit out this particular program. All right, so we're going to be iterating through 10,000 games over here. And then we have total reward, game score. These are going to just, just for like, you know, um, understanding purposes on our given output for our print statements. Uh, we're going to have, you know, a decimal value or so if the dinosaur is continuing on his way. Uh, as a increment of 0 0.1, or if he loses, you know, those could be a decrement of one. 
Uh, so we're gonna have like a positive or negative value reward system going on here. We're also have, gonna have a game score pretty much to determine you know how far the dinosaur has traveled. Now at the very beginning of each game, we're gonna be resetting our environment so that we are at the very beginning of the game. That's pretty much what that is happening here. Now, this is very important. Uh, we have a deck of a length four determined by blend over here. Um, and I'm just gonna be appending the states to this deck. Now, primarily what this uh, deck is gonna be doing is that it's gonna be an amalgamation of four images, specifically using this blend images function, which is essentially just taking the average of all the pixels that exist within that deck. If there's less than four values or four pictures, I should say, uh, we do take that into consideration and we just take the average of whatever else is in there. So that's pretty much happening there. And the reason behind that is that it's gonna get pretty much just four frames all together and then, you know, uh, to generate some form of a predictive outcome for the next state. Uh, and then we'll be plugging in that predictive state into the action function to, to retrieve some form of an action, whether or not the dinosaur should be jumping or you know doing nothing essentially. Uh, so we plug in that action to the step function over here, and then we can get four additional values. Uh, it will be the next image that comes along, the associated reward with that with the previous action that we have already taken, uh, the associated score, you know how well. Uh, the uh, dinosaur has done so far, you know, just get the, the roadmap score on how much distance has the dinosaur traveled and whether or not the dinosaur has actually hit an obstacle. Um, and then we'll just be appending that, uh, that new image to the image uh, deck. And then we're going to do another blending sessions uh, to get the next appropriate measure. We're then going to be plugging that into our memory buffer over here. Um, and this is where uh, we are actually going to be uh, mini batching from. So we're gonna be sampling 32 images, or I should say 32 values from the uh, array that this remember function is appending to. Uh, and then of course we have, you know, um, some additional reward systems that are, you know, incrementing or decrementing. And the uh, old state becomes a new state and it keeps on iterating through once this for loop has run its course. Uh, and of course, if the dinosaur has crashed, uh, we'll then want to train uh, based on his previous experiences and hopefully we can get all of the all the failures and successes based on that one game in order to you know hopefully improve upon you know its own understanding of how the game operates. So let's do a real quick demo on what that might look like. Let's go over here. And all you do is just do Python and then Chrome Dino Run. Go ahead and run that. And then a Selenium web browser just popped up over here. That's good. Uh, this is our model that was initialized that we printed out using the self.model. This, uh, yeah, this is our target model. And for the very first 100 or so iterations that's going to be going through, it will somewhat like, you know, like hang up on this. However, within each of the episodes that I'll be going through, it will become more streamlined as time goes on. So this is pretty much my demonstration on the reinforcement learning aspects of the dinosaur games. And after about 9,000 or so iterations that I've ran through, the highest score I actually got from this reinforcement learning process of this dinosaur doing its thing uh, was about 150. There are definitely a few ways that this process can be improved. First, I can use an entirely different deep Q model, such as a Sarsa model or a, or a double deep Q model for that instance. I can also switch up the policies that determine which action the model decides to use. Initially, this particular policy I was using was a epsilon greedy model, and this policy can change. Furthermore, I can also adjust how frequent the prediction network updates the target network weights for faster learning. And lastly, to speed up training time, I could also run the Selenium web application in parallel to have multiple games running for faster results. Nonetheless, I ran this process for about 24 hours and only achieved a score of 148, so there is definitely room for improvement.